transfer to uh, uh, Lorenza Berkeley National Laboratory. Well, she's also still there in one of her roles as a senior uh, technical staff. Uh, but since 2015, uh, she has also been uh, on the faculty of the Department of Material Science and Engineering at UC, UC Berkeley, uh, where she is now a full professor there. Uh, she's the director and co-founder of uh, the Materials Project, uh, and most recently also the director of the Molecular Foundry, that is a very uh, interesting uh, long-term initiative from the Department of Energy to offer uh, worldwide services uh, to users of both uh, uh, experimental and computational facilities. Uh, of course, in her research, uh, she has been, uh, among many things, a pioneer in the field of uh, uh, material design and innovation. And I think I will uh, listen to her very intently to learn uh, what she has been doing uh, in the uh, last few years. Uh, Christine, a very, very warm welcome. Very nice to have you here. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Nicola. It's really my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Let's see, I'm going to share my screen. How does that look? Perfect. All right. So it's my, I'm gonna uh, discuss our work in data-driven materials innovation and design, and maybe hopefully also give some pointers and get your feedback on what you, where you think as an audience we should be going in the space. So I don't know how many of you are material scientists. I know for sure that I didn't grow up uh, thinking I was gonna be a material scientist. Um, I had my eyes on archaeology as a young child. I think most people, if they think about, they think about chemistry and physics, but in my opinion, material science is really the, a beautiful marriage of physics and chemistry, and it's an incredibly important engineering uh, field if you think about our, our, our society, what we need, what, where we need to go. We wouldn't have our touch screens and our phones and our computers, which has enabled us at least to stay in contact with each other during this pandemic, if we didn't understand transparent conductors, and if we didn't know what defects do to light transmission for our internet age. And we are today blending in carbon composites into buildings and infrastructure to make it uh, lighter, uh, uh, cheaper, and also hopefully more corrosion resistant. And that's just a few of the areas. Um, going to our future challenges, of course, we'd like to, and especially since I work uh, a lot in energy production and energy storage, if we're going to truly leverage sustainable resources for, for energy production, we need uh, better materials. Solar panels are only as good as the underlying materials that absorb light turned into electricity, but also transport it through all the contacts and the glass and all the other components that unfortunately some of them degrade with time, and there's much to do there. If you think about um, wind and, and, and the wind resources we have across the world, Europe is much better at this than the US. But, and you could see in Texas what happened, I don't know if the, the news reached you, but Texas got really cold a few weeks ago and the a number of wind turbines had to shut down because of the ice that was forming. So, so anti-freeze um, anti coatings on wind turbine blades is more important than they know about it in other parts of the world, but it's again, a materials problem. And then of course, if you're gonna leverage all these intermittent resources, you do need storage. So uh, enabling cheaper, more long lasting batteries and for different kinds of applications is a real challenge and something that we are all working on. And again, a materials challenge. How do we enable better materials that can store that energy with it? safely and for a long time. Unfortunately, material science is not for the faint-hearted. It takes a long time from a material that, that, you, in, that you invent. Uh, if you work with experimentalists, as I do, we are all very excited if we can make a new material, and I'll show some examples of that. But the bad news is that if you make that material in the lab, so not just predict it, but actually make it, um, and that material performs better on some metrics uh, compared to the state of the art, you get super excited, you publish and your patents and you sort of move on with your research life. That's when the clock starts and it takes an average 15 to 18 years if or before that material makes it commercially. Um, so this is not something that the venture capitalists like to invest in. It's a very long-term game. And in order to accelerate it, 
there is one thing we can do and that is add more data to the problem. Uh, it's been said and documented both by the Department of Energy here in the US and by former presidents of the MIT um, that if we had more information about materials up front, we'd be smarter about choosing which ones to push towards com commercialization because it typically that long timeline takes from engineering away all the problems that exist with them. And we tend to focus only on a few metrics of importance when we, when we go after them in the lab. So data, data is really the centric uh, um, sort of topic of my talk. And if you Google data and materials, actually one of the premier pages that comes up in Wikipedia is materials problems or data problems in material science. And literally this is, well, almost verbatim from Wikipedia that we engineers spend hours trying to find property data of materials. It's not cataloged anywhere. In, in, in a free resource. Uh, most of the time it's like there are there is data available in companies, uh, but it's not freely available. Um, it's typically not across fields and there's very little opportunity of doing structure and chemistry correlations across different chemistries to try to come up with something better. Uh, material scientists often find themselves duplicating existing test results, again, because we don't know about data that's out there, we can't find it. Um, there are several design iterations due to outdated or inconsistent data. If you only find one data point in the literature, do you trust it? Do you have enough provenance to decide whether it's a good data point? And it can take weeks to more than that to trace the source of the data to support the design process. So let's, ima let's imagine that you uh, are trying to design a new thermoelectric material, to take an example. And from a physicist's point of view, this is about understanding how the electrons and the phonons are transported in your lattice and you're, you're, you're happily calculating electronic structures and, you're, and you know, um, things like the ZT to parametrize and how, how good this material in its bulk state is. That in itself is a data challenge and to correlate those kinds of properties across chemistries and structures. But then imagine also, having an eye towards where this material is going to be useful in a thermoelectric device where it's now going to cycle between different kinds of temperature it's going to experience thermal expansion it might lose contact and there's numerous of examples in the literature how the performance degrades of these materials even if they look great on the bench before you put them into a device so spanning these this property space from the bulk electronic structure and the thermal properties of the material to actually its implementation in the device and understanding those thermal as well as mechanical properties of materials is a fundamental challenge. And we still today do not really have the data resources to fully explore that space to drive innovation towards materials that have a greater chance of making it. And it would be great, right, to be able to capture waste these waste heat more uh, efficiently. Also, I can't have this talk without mentioning machine learning and AI. I, I think every student I get these days wants to do machine learning and, 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 when, and that's awesome. It's a great new tool, um, but I tend to liken machine learning algorithms as that beautiful shiny Ferrari that you'd love to drive. Unfortunately, you also need fuel to drive that Ferrari. And that fuel is the data. And that's actually the hard part in many cases, generating, organizing, and featureizing the scarce, scarce amount of data that we can still find in material science or producing it yourself, which is a lot of work. So um, if you wanna do machine learning, you first have to do data and that can take up to a year to produce or, or catalog or, or, or find the data that you're looking for. That being said, this is what we want. We really want to have accelerated learning, but we need to carefully think about the tools we need in order to get there. So from my perspective, as Nicola mentioned, I come from Sweden. I did my PhD in Stockholm. And when I was there as a young graduate student, and I'm sure many of you are also graduate students who are listening to this, I had no idea that density functional theory was gonna be one of the vehicles through which we could actually add more data to our data hungry materials world. In 1996, I, well, I was a first year graduate student and I spent the whole year on calculating the phonon dispersion curves of tungsten. So one element, one property, one year. Now that's because you know I had to 
parallelize the plane wave code. Thankfully, the plane wave code and the linear response code were written before I came there, but that had taken the whole, the whole PhD of previous students to do that. Um, so I was resting upon on the on the or I, on the shoulders of giants who came before me. Still, though, there was some work to be done. The pseudopotentials that we usually take for granted today, I had I had to. I had to parameterize it myself and parallelize these codes. And eventually after one year of hard work, we got the photon dispersion curves of tungsten and how they changed with pressure. Okay, so now fast forward about 20 years, 25 years, it's truly been a paradigm change. Density functional theory is much more robust than it was when I was a graduate student. We now have supercomputers that allow us to spit out these calculations on thousands of nodes. And we can calculate materials properties, maybe not exactly, but close enough in many cases. So that at least we can get trends and ideas of where the good things are in terms of different kinds of properties and how they correlate to crystal structure and chemistry. So today, 2021, imagine now this leap from one year, one, material, one element and one property. We now have over 130,000 calculated materials on the materials project with millions of associated materials properties. And I really want to highlight the property part there. We try very hard to fill out the property space because that's truly what you need in order to make, to do materials design. So we have apps that talk about battery metrics, um, voltages, capacities, safety in terms of oxygen release curves. We have probe diagrams that talk about how stable these materials are when you expose them to water, which is inc incredibly important if you're going to do anything that is in contact with moisture or actually operates in water of different pH. Uh, we have things like redox flow, battery, techno-economic analysis, what kind of solubility do you need to get of small molecules to be economically viable if you're doing a redox flow, non-aqueous redox flow battery. And if you're looking, for example, at uh, solid state batteries, there are serious concerns about interfacial reactions, and that's something we can calculate from thermodynamics and the kind of DFT data we get. So these are just a few examples, there are many others. And when you have this kind of data and these analysis tools at your fingertips, the idea is that you now can move closer to an in silico design and move away from the Edisonian design. Edisonian being sort of the way where you have an idea, you go and talk to an experimentalist. They may say, yes, that will work. Or like, maybe that will work. I'll try to make it. You make the material, you test it. And most of the time you have to throw it away because it does not beat state of the art. And you keep trying until one day you get, you get a hit, which takes typically a very long time. In the in silico approach, you would at least pre-screen materials. And you would look at larger spaces in terms of chemistries and structures to find those hot spots or pockets where potentially really good materials for a particular application would be and why. You would, only, you would also know why, right? Because you would have those properties, you would correlate them to their fundamental constituents and atoms and the ions and the electrons in the material. And then you would work with your friendly experimental group and, and sort of say, well, where, do, where would you like to go? Where are the synthesis capabilities? And come to a conclusion of where you, which ones you wanna make and put a more focused effort into those higher ranked candidates as compared to the trial and error approach. So I am by far not the only one doing this. Uh, these are some of the examples that either the materials project, which Nicola mentioned, or colleagues that are associated with the materials project have done since 2005 that I am aware of. So we started in 2005 to, and actually as a consulting project to, to try to calculate properties of the cathode in alkaline batteries. So the small non-rechargeables we have in some of our devices, mouse, like your, your, your computer mouse or your pointer. Um, we spent a year uh, and the company's money and we came up with a list of about 200 compounds that had the potential beating manganese dioxide that was that is today or is still today in most alkaline batteries, the cathode, that had a chance of being better as well as being somewhat cost conscious because manganese dioxide is dirt cheap. I'll, I'll get back to that story. Uh, this really gave me the, 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 the passion I have today for doing computational data-driven materials design because I saw that this could work. It was really exciting to me. 
And after that, this sort of took off uh, from lithium ion electrodes to uh, conductors, to magnesium cathodes, photocatalysts, thermoelectrics, piezoelectrics, LED, and all of these materials that I mentioned here and that I cite are materials that have been predicted in the computer first and then made, synthesized, tested, and found to work as predicted. So they're truly examples of computational design. Now, in 2019, I'm proud to say that after a long time, um, so 14 years uh, from 2005, uh, Duracell is now blending in one of those 200 materials that, that we predicted. It's not exactly the same material, the same crystal structure and the same base chemistry, but they did introduce defects and coatings to protect the material, which was at higher voltage than manganese dioxide. So needs to be safe for, for oxygen release. Um, but that is my only example of something that has gone all the way to commercialization. I've seen all the stumble blocks that's happened along the way. It is a truly a long road. But that being said, in 2005, we started from predictions, not just not something that was actually made. So it's slightly earlier than the timeline I showed before. So this is, this is really the vision that the materials project was um, founded upon, uh, that we can accelerate materials discovery through the development of advanced scientific uh, computing methods and design, that we can scale these computations over high performance computing centers to truly add more data to our data hungry world, uh, to, to get insights of where to go for different kinds of examples or applications. And in this case, also disseminate the data, which we did not do in the consulting project um, across the world with its associated design tools to, to enable everybody, not just the team that produced the data to solve all, some of our problems, which are truly worldwide and rely on material solutions to get there. So these are the four fundamental pillars of the materials project. We produce in-house code in order to organize and to enable the, the scale up of all these calculations. We uh, save that data into a database, which we make available through an API to disseminate it both through our website, as well as you, know, you, can, you can use the API directly to download our data for free. And then we showcase design in a few examples to show what can you do? What are the different ways that you can slice and dice this data and analyze it to actually come up with better materials in different, in different ways. So I'll give you an overview of all these pillars, um, and, but I, I can't go into depth of all of them. So hopefully you get a flavor of, of all the work that goes into producing this data, organizing it, and then the fun part, which, which is designing novel materials with it, and maybe where the forefront or where the challenges still lie today. So the materials project has a few in-house codes that we've developed since the very beginning. The oldest one is PyMatGen, Python Materials Genomics. Uh, that really is the input and output code. It allows us to generate thousands of input files for a particular class of materials that we wanna investigate and their properties um, for the different kinds of, of software packages that are now available that was not really truly available when I was a graduate student. So VASP, uh, Quantum Espresso, Abinit, depending on what's your flavor of DFT and what, what do you wanna calculate. It also helps you uh, analyze the output so once the output comes from any of these codes, PyMetion turns that into band structures, face diagrams, all the sort of engineering properties. You don't have to be an expert in, in computational materials design to understand the output. Fireworks is our workflow code, the one that um, organizes these calculations. As anyone who run these calculations know, they, they often fail or sometimes fail. They also occasionally need what I would call dynamic reroutes. So for example, uh, you realize that, wow, I didn't, you know, I'm calculating insulators, I'm getting a certain error, I now need to fix that error and I need to reroute and I can make a different decisions. So Fireworks was built to enable those kind of dynamical fixes on the fly. It also needs to talk to a database of existing um, experience. Uh, so we keep basically recipes of what, what fails and what doesn't and how should you approach it if, you're, if you want to get the boss, best possible results. And in the old days, that was done by a human, but we can now increasingly do that automatically. And if you combine PyMetGen and Fireworks, you get Aftimate, which is basically a recipe-based recipe workflows for a particular property. So for example, it's a three line of code can now enable you to run 
DFT calculations for thousands of materials using FMAID, for example, for the piezoelectric tensor, for the dielectric tensor, across insulators, metals, semiconductors, different kinds of materials that need different kinds of input parameters. And then there's a RESTful API, uh, the materials API that we designed many years ago. And we're also very happy to be partners in the Optimate API that is a, a global, I would say, initiative to have one API that talks to all of the databases that are out there. And that helps anyone who will be able to basically access the database and get loads of data for whatever they wanna do with it. Um, codes are difficult. Uh, we made the decision early on to be open source. Um, it does mean that means that, of course, that you're going to give out your hard work for free. But on the other hand, you get the payback of other people helping you now developing that code if it's a successful code. So we now have contributions from all over the world. Pymaton is, is really becoming quite popular. Uh, we have the model of benevolent dictators, which uh, monitor every single uh, pull requests into the main branch and um, monitor them to make sure that they come with clear documentation uh, and unit tests. And this is really incredibly important to make sure that these codes are useful across generations of PhD students and postdocs. Uh, it's, it's not trivial uh, to keep this going, but I rely on, on the folks here with their icons that they spend their evenings and weekends to look over code and make sure that it stays as good as possible. Data is also a huge challenge organization wise. Uh, we are, you might think that once you've calculated something, you're done. But as we know, density functional theory keeps improving, the codes keep improving, we get new functionals. So we're actually constantly recomputing old data as well as new data in the materials project. We add properties, but we also go back and, and look at old calculations from our early days in 2012, 2013. Is this still valid? Can we do better? So we have testing. Every time we do a new database release, we test all the data against what is what we consider known truths, which materials should be stable. If there's a major change in any of the hulls or the phase diagrams, we take special care to look at it and see what happened there. Is there something that we missed, something that went wrong? Uh, warnings are generated and we have now a deprecation process for materials that we calculated maybe in the old days in a certain way. And we feel like this is a better way of doing it. Um, so we still keep that data. If somebody needs to go back because they published using that data or they wanna refer back to it, that data is still there but it's not the one you're gonna see when you log into the website right away. You have to go through the API. So now if you have a student or your postdoc or whatever is coming say like, I wanna do machine learning on new dielectric materials or new elastic materials with specifically exotic elastic properties. And you tell them the bad news that first they have to generate the data. This is the process they have to go through. They first have to design a workflow using PyMet and then Fireworks and then and, and Atomate workflow in that case, that is robust enough that if you set it out for any kind of material, whether it be a, you know, containing heavy elements, insulators, semiconductors, whatnot, the workflow has to be robust enough to pick out the right input parameters for this particular chemistry. And you test that workflow on what we would call the gold standard. And what is the gold standard? Well, that is still experiments, right? So now you have to curate from the literature, this doesn't exist in any one place, the properties you're looking for. In the case of the elastic tensor, we found about 200 full elastic tensors in the open literature when we started this project many years ago. Um, so that became the gold standard. We curated that set and we tested our workflow against those 200 uh, tensors. And once we were within plus minus 15% of reproducing those without any manual intervention, we thought we were good enough. And that's really as, as, as good as you can do, right? And then you have to trust DFT to be consistently right or consistently wrong. Um, and after that, here be dragons. You go and calculate the rest of the world. So then you get like uh, cool, so you can, if you're today's youth, you go and tweet all your, your great results or you post it on Facebook. Um, uh, so today we have calculated over 14,000 elastic tensors are available in the materials project. So it's by far the, by orders of magnitude, the largest resource for understanding how materials behave under deformation, which is such a fundamental property and important in many applications. 
So that hopefully gave you an idea of how much work there sits under the hood of producing this data, of organizing it and, 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 and disseminating it. So I'll, now I'll talk about the more slightly more exciting part, which is the design. I'll give three examples uh, and they all are slightly different in magnetocalorics, piezoelectrics and water splitting photocatalysts. And they're different in the sense that <clears throat> yes, from the computational perspective, we were all focusing on particular metrics that we thought were useful and that we could calculate somewhat robustly. But when you, <clears throat> when you partner with an experimental team, the aspect of synthesis and characterization becomes incredibly important. And that's where really the difference comes in in these three cases. And I hope to highlight some of the challenges that we have. So if you start with the magnetocaloric materials, this started a few many years ago when we thought, well, the materials part doesn't really have a good uh, body of, of, of work on magnetic materials. They have different conf magnetic configurations. We, most of our materials were just initialized with ferromagnetic magnetic ordering. In some cases we knew of, of antiferromagnetic, we've done it for the binaries, but that was pretty much it. So we thought we absolutely need a workflow for at least collinear magnetic behavior. So that was designed and benchmarked against the best quality neutron data we could find in 2019. Um, that's been dis that's being continually disseminated as this workflow keeps running on all of the materials. It takes quite a while to actually chart out all the possible, or at least not all the possible, but a good chunk of them, uh, of the magnetic orderings that for any single magnetic material. So we also thought that in the same time, we should look at something, a cool application of this. So magnetocaloric materials seems to be a good, good um, space. We were fortunate that um, another group at UC Santa Barbara, Ramses Adri's group had all been interested in magnetocaloric materials and have been looking at them for a while. Magnetocaloric materials are materials that start out in, a, for example, a ferromagnetic configuration. And if you apply a, a field uh, to these materials, one way or the other, you can switch them from a ferromagnetic to a non-magnetic state. And with that switching comes associated, of course, and magnetic entropy, but also sometimes other kinds of entropy if that magnetic transformation also couples to a structural transformation. That entropy is, of course, now also associated with a change in heat. So you can now cycle these materials using a, a magnetic field and, and, and basically trigger them to, to um, absorb or desorb heat. So think of them as basically solid state refrigeration or, or heat absorbent uh, materials. It turned out, so Sashadri's group have found a, a nice, clean and simple computational, computationally accessible descriptor for high performing magnetic caloric materials, which they call the deformation descriptor. It's basically calculating the volume difference, which is, you know, crude, but very, very, very useful and not that hard to calculate. The volume difference between the ferromagnetic state and the non-magnetic state and taking that as a descriptor of what is a good performing magnetocaloric materials. And they plotted that descriptor, you see on the bottom axis here against known experimentally verified change in entropy for some of the magnetocaloric materials that's been studied in the literature. And you can see there aren't that many, but there's a nice correlation between the descriptor and the performance metric. So we took that and we, we ran it over many, many of the um, magnetic materials in the materials project. And we found that, they, yes, you get a steeply decreasing curve as you demand higher magnetic deformation, but there are some materials out there and some that would be interesting to look at. And specifically in the sort of five, six, seven and eight percent of magnetic deformation. One of the materials that we picked out and we picked it out together with the Sashadra group because they were interested in partnering with us to make it, was a manganese antimonide, which had a predicted deformation descriptor up there in the sort of five, six, and 7%. After uh, some time, this material was a material that had been made. It was available. There was a synthesis recipe in, in the literature, but it had been never could be considered for magnetocaloric applications before. So, in terms of, of a design sort of idea, it's this, one of the more low hanging fruit. It's, it's an existing material, you know how to make it, but it has never been seen to have this kind of capability before. The Sashadri group was able to make it. 
you can also make it off stoichiometric. And our computations showed that if you included more manganese into this material, you actually well, you created interstitial manganese and that interstitial manganese decreased the magnetic uh, deformation. It actually went antiferromagnetic, so you get less of the magnetic response from the material when, it, when it, it's collinearly in one direction. Um, but it also allowed you to tune the temperature at which this material switched. So we had now a nice way of tuning by chemistry the, the actual onset of the switching for this material, which is sort of a, a, a good way of making it into a material that can perform at a particular target temperature. On the other hand, of course, the, the, the magnetic deformation decreased, so there's slightly less response. But overall, a, a, a good example of how you can pick out one material out of 5,000 and actually get a material that performs uh, according to the predictions. I'll take another example. This is from the, uh, our calculations of the piezoelectric tensor that started earlier in 2016. Uh, in this case, we had much less to test on. We found 50 experimental tensors in the literature that we could test our workflow for before we just have to decide to, to trust it. Um, out of those materials, we picked out one that we calculated. We calculated over 900 in the beginning. Now I think we have something like 3,000 piezoelectric tensors on the materials project. One of the ones we took out was a strontium hafnium oxide that had a predicted high piezoelectric response and that as far as we could tell had not been seen before. But the, this is worse, this material was worse news than the manganese and timonide. If you put in strontium hafnium oxide in the materials project, you get a list that looks a bit like this, where the green field, green shaded polymorphs are the ones that are seen experimentally and the non, non um, the gray ones are the ones that are what I would call hypothetical or theoretical. They have not been seen as far as we know. The one that the polymorph we were looking at was this one. It's a theoretical polar tetragonal version of a perovskite, but it's competing with no less than five materials that are predicted to be lower in enthalpy, so more accessible by synthesis, and three of them have been made before. So this is a tremendous challenge. And it's only because we had such fearless <laughs> collaborators at NREL, uh, one of the laboratories here in the US, um, that they said, yep, yeah, no, we, we should be able to make this. We're gonna use epitaxial templating to make this particular material. And now we also use our computations to try to guide them. Uh, epitaxial templating basically means you have a film, a substrate that preferentially stabilizes one material, one polymorph over others. And this seems perfect in this case because we really, really wanted to penalize those lower energy polymorphs versus the higher one that's never been made before. So by using our computations as a guide, we found that a strontium titanate doped with niobium would be a really good, um, substrate because it would just strain those lower poly energy polymorphs more so they would get higher in energy and it would be perfectly suited for our strontium hafnium oxide. In this case, it took two years for the experimental team to successfully make this material under the right conditions to get that target one and also prove that it was indeed that polymorph and not any of the other ones that are more likely, quite honestly, to be made. Um, and Indeed, also it showed piezoelectric response as well as actually ferroelectric, which we hadn't computed. So that was sort of a bonus point. All right, my last example in terms of, comp of, of a computational design driven um, uh, materials exploration is in photocatalysts. So this is the endeavor to use any of our feedstock, chemical feedstock, hydrogen, CO2, water, and turn it into, or any of our feedstocks there between water and CO2 and turn it into viable fuels, liquid fuels. Um, I joined the Joint Center of Artificial Photosynthesis pretty late in the first version of it. Um, and we were trying to see if we can use the materials project as a sort of um, um, a, a, a machine for coming up with good suggestions, where should we be going? Um, we were in this case looking for an oxygen evolution photocatalyst. And the criteria for a good photoanode is really you want a va valence band maximum with it closely within the oxygen evolution reaction potential. So you want to generate those holes with the right energy. 
you want a band gap with the right energy so you can absorb your sunlight in, 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 at a maximum efficiency, so between one and two AV, and you need photochemical stability at either very acid or very alkaline conditions because you need a medium with high conductivity. And that's one criteria that is very often overlooked uh, because it's just harder to compute corrosion. Uh, this is where our Corbe diagrams came in really handy. So if you looked at the, in those days, the, what, what was the sort of state of the art for, photo, for, for oxygen evolution photocatalysts, the, the sort of semiconductor families that you see at the top of that table did pretty well on criteria number one. They did reasonably well on criteria number two, but they do pretty abysmally at criteria number three. They tend to corrode or form passivation films in, when they get exposed to water. On the other hand, oxides tend to do better in water. Uh, they're more stable, but they, all, they don't do so well on having the right band gap and the right band alignment. So we were gonna use the materials project to see if we can find those needles in the haystack of oxides that came with a be better stability a priori, but also had that right band gap and band alignment potentially. We didn't have a ton of time because like I said, we were, joined, we were joined pretty late. So we didn't choose the whole periodic table and every possible crystal structure. We decided to limit our first search on chromium, manganese and vanadium based ternary oxides. And if you just do that search from the materials project in those days, you got about 3000 materials. Today I'll get a different number, but the point here being that you don't have to calculate these. This is sort of a five minute search and that data is already there for you. We screened those 3000 for some sort of appreciation of phase stability. We didn't want something that was super unstable with a high enthalpy of formation because that seems to correlate with difficulty of synthesis. We also wanted a reasonable guess at the band gap, but as you know, DFT doesn't do so well in the band gap. So we had a really wide criteria there that filtered our results down to 400. Again, we haven't done a single calculation yet. This is all just taking the data from the materials project. 400, that's when you think like, okay, maybe now we can do, do, start to do some calculations. So we did, we used another functional that does a bit better on the band gap. So we used that, used that functional HSC and now we could limit the, the window acceptance for the band gap a bit more to get close to that target. And now we were down to 169. We now calculated the surfaces and bandage energies and we screened for stability in water, which is one of the big killers and in the end ended up with 47. So that's the magic number, 47 out of the 3000 possible candidates that contain these kinds of cations and were ternary oxides. Now comes the beauty of partnering with somebody who has more of an automated workflow for doing the experiments as well as the computations. So John Gregoire at Caltech has this beautiful inkjet printing machine where he can make tons of materials at a single, uh, as a single batch. Um, so giving him the 47 phases, he was able to, in a fairly short amount of time, make 17 of them through combi. And here's the, here's the great result. 16 out of those 17 showed photocurrent at the ox oxygen evolution potential. So they were actually, so 16 out of 17 had some sort of sign of life and they were screened by computational results. And we were also now, because we had all the band structure information about these materials, we knew what they looked like from a DFT point of view. We could correlate those insights with the photocurrent and see what are the design metrics we should be going for? How can we understand and get even better at predicting novel photocatalysts? And it turned out that it was really about the sort of the vanadium um, 3D band character at the conduction band minimum and minimizing the oxygen character at the valence band maximum that those two uh, metrics correlated well with having the right band gap and the right band alignment. My last example, and I won't, this won't take long, um, is that you might think now that everything's successful, we just partner with our friendly experimentalist, even though it takes time, always great materials come out of it. That's not entirely true. Um, here's a beautiful potential magnesium cathode material that we predicted many years ago. We published it, we've never found a single experimentalist who's willing to make it. Uh, if it was to be made, we believe it would be the fastest magnesium cathode out there. But it really, this is a crystal structure that relies on double substitutions of two cations. And whenever we talk to this and an experimentalist that's interested in that does solid state synthesis, they look at this and go like, I have no idea how to make this. So that brings me to one of the challenges. And you, I'm sure you've seen the arc in my examples that we went from 
relatively simple to make. There is a synthesis recipe in the literature as an existing material, but with unknown properties to hypothetical materials that take years to make, and you're not even sure you're gonna be successful, to automation where you can get more hit rates and hopefully do better in terms of, of, of finding something useful. So synthesis is one of our major bottlenecks today. Synthesis is a characterization and we need to get better at this, both from a computational as well as an experimental point of view. We don't know today when we send somebody in the lab if what their chances of success are. And the synthesis methods are different depending on what groups you're talking about and what kind of classes of materials. Um, to try to get some handle on how to understand synthesis, we started with doing just statistics of the ICSD and filtering out all the materials that actually have been made and under what conditions. And we correlate that with our computed en energy or enthalpy above the hull, so in the phase diagram. So the dark blue bars on the bar diagram are basically, is basically that statistics for oxides. And as you can see, it's again, sharply decreasing trend as you go higher in energy above hull or enthalpy above hull, you have much less likelihood of success because there are less known materials that actually have been made. So if you, for example, put your criteria at 100 MeV per atom on that bar graph, you capture 80% of all known oxides that have been made and that survive at ambient conditions. That sounds reasonable, 80%, not too bad, but you're missing 20%. Maybe there are really cool functional materials out there that in that 20%. So if you put your computational screening criteria at 100 MeV per atom, which we often do, then you might miss out on some really interesting materials. That's for oxides. And if you then do the same analysis for things like nitrites and sulfites, you find that in the nitrite family, and that's the blue curve you see in the cumulative number, percentage of compounds, and you put your metric at 100 MeV per atom, you actually only get 50% of all known nitrites. So it seems like the window of metastability of actually being able to make metastable nitrite is much wider in that space than it is in oxides. And we, when we started this, we didn't know why. Even that fundamental difference, we didn't quite understand. So we were interested to see, is there even a way for us to bound synthesizability so that we know that above this metric for a particular class or chemistry, we should not go. Is there an upper limit for synthesizability, at least to start with? And then we can start figuring out what the competition between different polymorphs and different synthesis methods. So this is the question we asked ourselves some years ago. And we took some inspiration from how actual synthesis happens. So if you're gonna make a specific ordered polymorph of tantalum nitride, you might start with an oxide precursor and ammonia, and you're heating that up or doing something to it. Um, and you're breaking the bonds of your precursors and you are wondering, am I gonna make the ordered polymorph or am I gonna just make amorphous gunk? Obviously the amorphous gunk is always kinetically accessible because you're already breaking bonds and making gunk, right? The question is what comes out of that? So kinetically accessible is the amorphous phase, but what about thermodynamically? Sorry. Um, Thermodynamically, we assume that the amorphous phase, which is sort of liquid-like in its organization, has a higher entropy that makes a ton of sense. Configurational entropy should be much higher in the amorphous phase, phase, which means that the slope of your Gibbs free energy curve with temperature is gonna be more steep for the amorphous phase, starting out from some value at T equals zero. So your polymer B and C in the diagram here has a window of thermodynamic stability, whether they're kinetically accessible or not depends on your synthesis method, but they are thermodynamically accessible compared to the amorphous state for a certain window of temperature. But polymorph A that starts out with a higher enthalpy of formation at T equals zero has no thermodynamic driving force for it whatsoever compared to the amorphous phase, which again is always kinetically accessible. So we hypothesize that an, en an upper energy limit for polymorph synthesizability is set by the enthalpy of the analogous amorphous phase. Okay, so we tested that hypothesis on over 40 systems. And for each system with slightly different stoichiometry, you have to recalculate the amorphous limit because the amorphous state is different for, for example, cobalt oxide and cobalt dioxide. And this, the, the, the bars on this bar graph, is, that is the calculated amorphous enthalpy. And it, this is an approximation, of course, because the amorphous state is slightly different, but you have to take a big enough box and make sure you quenched it and annealed it well enough so that it looks 
reasonably amorphous. You calculate that enthalpy, and then you the, the 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 circles that we show also here. The filled circles are materials that have been made successfully and that survive at ambient pressure, because again, also that amorphous state is different depending on what the different pressures you have. So surviving at ambient pressure and has been made successfully. Whereas the open circles are materials that either have never been made, as far as we know or were made at higher pressure or some other conditions. And when they were brought down to ambient pressure, they either amorphize or decompose to something else. And as you can see, there's not a single system on these over 40 systems that violate the amorphous limit of synthesizability. All the filled uh, circles are below the bar and all the open circles are above the bar. And this is really cool because it now gives us at least a way to screen up really bad ideas in terms of synthesizability and not send our poor experimental graduate students and postdocs into the lab and trying for months and months to make that cool material that was predicted. We also get a sense of understanding where this comes from. Where does the idea of a larger window of metastability come from? And where are the pockets of really wide windows of metastability so we can get cool functional materials? So if you look at, for example, boron oxide has a pretty low amorphous enthalpy, because it doesn't, it's pretty happy being amorphous. All it cares about is just arranging, having its local short range order of its little boron oxide tetrahedra. How those are organized long range, it doesn't really care. But if you look at boron nitride instead, really wants to form these very ordered networks, which means it hates being in an amorphous structure. And therefore the amorphous enthalpy is so high. So you get a high window metastability, which is exactly what we saw previously, that nitrites have a much higher polymorph accessibility at higher, uh, at, at higher enthalpy. And of course, this is why we have such cool structures in the carbon family. That's the skyscraper where all the buckyballs and nanowires and nanotubes exist because the amorphous state is so high in enthalpy, it allows all these other structures to stabilize under different conditions. And this gives us now better than this arbitrary limit of 100 MeV per atom across all systems, because we see there's a huge variability between different kinds of chemistries, and this will help us to design or to guide our experimental efforts in the right direction. And hopefully with better efficient screening. So we call this, this the synthesizability skyline. All right, I'm just going to end. I think I have a, a few minutes left, and I'll be very happy to take questions with the data and dissemination aspect. So hopefully I've given you a sense of what you can do with data uh, to go into the design of novel materials and why that's so important. Um, today in the materials project, we have over 130,000 crystalline compounds with a lot of associated materials properties. And as you can see, we've focused a lot on actually adding properties rather than adding crystal structures to our database. Uh, from elastic tensors to dielectric tensors to piezoelectric tensors to battery properties. And we've even gone into experimentally uh, like aiding experiments, experiments in characterization of materials. So we've calculated over 500,000 K edge Zane spectra. We've also calculated XSAFs and uh, L edge spectra. And those are coming. They're not available quite yet on the materials part, but they're going to come very soon. They're all computed to help us in recognizing local structure of materials faster and do data-driven characterization as well. Um, this has enabled us to actually do machine learning too on experimental spectra. So if you log into the materials project and you have a spectra of some material and you know it's, a, for example, a manganese oxide, but you don't know what it looks like locally. Uh, you don't know what crystal structure, if it has a crystal structure, it may not be completely crystalline. Maybe it's a nanoparticle with slightly different, uh, different, uh, different structure than the bulk. Um, you can upload that spectra and just add that you know it's manganese and oxygen. And now we'll use machine learning algorithms trained on the computed data, which we can correlate the spectra peaks and their position with the computed local environment of our materials. And now give you a sense of what is likely to be your coordination environment for the manganese in your material and what is the valence state. As I said, machine learning is big. And because we're one of the largest data providers, if not the largest data providers in the materials property space, freely available, the number of groups and people that do machine learning on the materials product is rapidly increasing. We have on average one paper per day that cites the materials project and machine learning uh, and is published. So one published paper per day. 
we also see that the community is doing great stuff with this data. We have examples of groups that have invented novel phosphor materials and super hard materials based on the data that we provide. And this is really great. This is exactly the vision of the materials project that the data was going to be for the benefit of everybody to accelerate, accelerate everybody's efforts into coming up with novel materials for uh, better applications and, and a better world. The materials project in itself has come up. I've given you some examples. Here are more examples of materials that we have predicted and then made for thermoelectrics, for photocatalysts, for carbon capture, electrides, and we hope to keep on going. This is, this is an ongoing challenge, how to make and understand how to make new materials. Um, we, our number of users keep growing exponentially. We now have over 180,000 registered users, but maybe even more importantly, because I think this is still limited by word of mouth. People sort of need to figure out, need to know that Mitchell's party is out there for them to use it. Um, we deliver on average um, 2 million data records per day to this increasingly data hungry world. And sometimes we have spikes of over 45 million data records. This has forced us, which is a good thing, to put the database on many different servers and spin them up as the, as the demand for data waxes and wanes during the day. And uh, we're actually in the process of moving, moving our um, whole operation to a more a robust 24 seven up service so that we can be even more responsive. We're used all over the world. Um, we're particularly happy to be used in part of the world where you know access to expensive and licensed journals may not always be a given. Until recently, we were banned for Elsevier in California. So I'm, I'm part of that community as well. So having access to free data is incredibly important for democratizing knowledge and democratizing science. And with that, I'll just thank my group without which nothing would actually work. And I'll be very happy to take questions. Christian, that was uh, wonderful. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, and indeed, um, so people are welcome to raise their hand because this is in webinar mode, then uh, I will uh, unmute them. Um, and uh, they are also welcome if they don't feel like uh, speaking. Uh, to write the, the the question in the question and answer pane that that should be that should be available. So while we get people, uh, you know, get set up and started with uh, raising hand or question and answer, uh, Kristen, I'll ask you first. Uh, let's say a question from a say a computational scientist, and that is. Uh, you know, if you had, uh, let's say, a magic wand, but uh, a cheap one, where you can only express uh, one desire, but there is, you know, that thing that, uh, you know, has frustrated you since uh, the tungsten time, uh, what is that you would ask uh, to the computational world uh, to, to give you that uh, you don't have now and that you would like very much? Oh, dear. Um, the perfect functional. <laughs> 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 um... It's we're we're in, we're in the process of recalculating everything with scan, and okay. it's been two versions of scan already, and we are seeing improvements. But of course, it's not across the board. Some some spaces are better than others. So, and how do you communicate that with your experimental colleagues that mm -hmm. the world has different shades of accuracy depending on what you want? It's always been one of our challenges. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's, I suppose I have many other issues too, but that was the first one to come up because it's yeah. so expensive too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but you see, I mean, wh where does it improve? I mean, is it uh, formation energy? Is it the thermodynamics uh, that gets? Yeah, it's out? it's yeah. very often the thermodynamics. Scan seems to do better in getting the the competition between different polymorphs in the same space, yeah. and that's really important for us, especially thinking about synthesizability competition between po different polymorphs. If one is, as you saw in the strontium, strontium hafnium oxide example, how high you are above that ground state really matters whether we're going to send somebody in the lab or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, Christine. I have many more questions, but let me also, uh, we'll have uh, Jean-Sabine McEwen. Uh, so please go ahead, uh, you, you are muted. Um, hello, very interesting talk. Um, I, you talked a lot about bulk properties. What about surface properties in the material project? Could you give a little bit of a flavor? Because that expands the computational space even more. Yeah, it does. Um, so we, we do it for um, specific applications. As you saw in the photocatalyst example, we did calculate it for 
a number of materials when we needed the, the, the band edge alignment. Um, we are also we also calculated for elemental metals to get the work function. It's it's like you say, it's increasingly expensive. So it's not something we've been able to do for thousands or even well, tens of thousands of materials yet. We actually have it for thousands of materials for the band edge alignment because we've done so much work for Lisa. Not all of it is accessible yet, but it hopefully will be. But it does add a whole other complexity. We have workflows for the work function and the surface stability, which helps us to at least fill it out in certain spaces, but getting it to the point where the bulk properties the point where we have data coverage in the bulk properties will take more computing resources. But the, 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 the methods are there. It's just the computing, honestly. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And uh, we have uh, Alexander Hoffman. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, great overview. It has improved very much over the time I'm observing a materials project. And I've got a uh, more like a technical question because I'm working for industry and um, I wonder if it's possible to put the data, which is mostly private, uh, on premise so that the data doesn't move uh, to the materials project database. Is this possible? Um, so would you, so you're saying you want your private company data to be comparable or uploaded, but not accessible to, I'm, I'm sure I'm not, Quite understanding what um, you mean. Yeah, somehow. I'm not sure if it's possible to have a, a part of the database uh, which I create or with my private calculations in the company mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. keep it private and not share, uh, at least for now. And maybe I share it later uh, with yep. the community. Is this so possible? actually? So actually there is, we've been constant, we have been aware for many years now that there is a need from the community to be able to either share or not share their own data, depending on how they want it. And they want to be able to leverage the organization of the materials product and, and allow those data sets to talk to each other. So for some years now, we've developed uh, a separate database or separate data infrastructure called MP Contribs that stands for materials product contributions. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind that is really that the person who made who produced the data owns the data so we, we we don't own it but we allow people to upload their data decide if they're going to make it public or not but they can now tag their data with different kinds of tags that can talk to data in the materials project and you get an api and a material and, and a database infrastructure for free all you need to do is send an email <laughs> to my, my, you can Google it and you will get the email mm -hmm. there to one of my staff members and he can help you to get started. Okay, thank you very much again. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, I'll read uh, some questions. So, so we have uh, Anandra Chandrasekharan uh, that asks, uh, do you see a potential integration of uh, machine learning force fields uh, and uh, the materials informatics effort uh, that you have? Uh, definitely. I mean, uh, people are already using the materials project data, the inorganic uh, crystal structures on their energies um, <clears throat> to fit force fields. We don't have available yet, um, for example, trajectories for from molecular dynamic simulations or other kinds of dynamic data that you would probably also need. Um, but I think people tend to today use both, like they paint structures and energies and they use and they simulate the trajectories themselves and they fit that. So yes, I do think that there is an avenue for that. I already see people using it. We have a number of those trajectories available in the house. We just haven't been able to make them available yet. There's a lot of effort in, in the dissemination aspect of making data available in a robust way. So, and given my fairly small team still, we haven't been able to do it, but there's data, more data there than, than, than is accessible. So yes, definitely. That, that avenue is there and should be more. Cool, thanks. Uh, thanks, Christine. I read a question from uh, Daniel Kassar. Uh, what kind of uh, machine learning algorithm do you use in your workflows? Uh, you showed a neural network in the slides, uh, but I wonder if there are other algorithms that are also used. 
So we tend to use whatever makes sense for the application, depending on how much data we have. We've gone from everything from unsupervised learning to highly featureized uh, machine learning. And I, my experience and in the different flavors of this is more than I can go over. I can really recommend you to take a look at MathMiner and AutoMathMiner, which are two separate packages being disseminated by the Jane group at LBNL which allows you very rapidly to test out the data sets and machine learning on them using existing machine learning algorithms, see how well they do. So at least if you're gonna come up with your home brewed version of machine learning, you're doing better than just sort of the black boxes out there. What we found, if I'm gonna sort of put the materials, our experience spin on this is that given that the materials, the materials field still has limited <clears throat> amounts of data compared to social sciences and weather data and all kinds of other things. Um, the more you understand about your data set, the better typically you can featureize it and pick those specific descriptors. For example, I just had a, a, a data set on NMR spectra. And you know we have like something like 3000 NMR spectra for silicon oxide. So that's a large data set from a materials point of view, but not a large data set if you're Google. And I had one student that tried to just out of sort of the black box, you know, okay, I'm just gonna see if I can predict the, 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 the spectra for these NMR, these NMR spectra or, understand, or predict the coordination structure from the spectra. And he did okay, but it wasn't amazing. But then I had another student coming in who really truly understands NMR and he was able to construct the descriptor that was extremely sensitive to the local environment. And once he included that descriptor, suddenly the whole data set just sang. So I would say that a lot of the, the effort in my group is trying to use as much as of our understanding of what we're looking for and how it correlates to particular features to, to make the, the machine learning algorithms do better. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I, I'm not very good at giving exact, like- Oh, no, that, that's yeah. very good. Also, we have many other questions. So, so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll have one more from the question and answer. And that is Abhishek that is asking, uh, what are the resources you need to get started with the materials project? Um, well, we started with, uh, with very little resources. I, I had this little skunk works group at, at LBNL that were all working for free actually in the beginning because they were so excited about doing this from the high performance computing group to, to uh, people in data management and material scientists. We got a small LBR grant and small, I mean, 200,000 per year, which paid for like one postdoc. And that was one year. But on that vision, we were able to sell it to the Department of Energy. And then we got 2 million a year. And we've been doing our work on 2 million per year since 2012. And that pays for about four staff scientists, no, not really, two staff scientists and uh, the enthusiastic graduate students and some postdocs of 10 professors and, and scientists. So that's, that's our team currently. Thanks. And I guess if instead that you want to use the materials project, you probably just need a, a computer and an internet connection and then depending yeah. on how much you want to download. Pretty much, yeah. And a little bit of API maybe and Python knowledge is useful, but yeah, you can use it just with a computer if you go through the website. Yeah, I'll go uh, to a live question from uh, Niklas uh, Osterbacher. Niklas, please. Uh, hi there. Uh, so my question is about uh, complex metal oxides and metal oxides in general, I suppose. Um, in transition metal oxides in particular, um, like titanium dioxide, for instance, um, excess charges tend to form polarons rather than being delocalized over the entire structure. Uh, and the introduction of defects obviously introduces excess charges into the lattice. Um, but the uh, energetic ground state, at least from a DFT perspective, uh, isn't always accessible by simply removing an atom or adding an interstitial, for instance. You actually need to uh, push atoms together or um, rattle the lattice quite considerably to find the ground state uh, energetically. Would that be possible to automate? Um, and is that something you would consider integrating into materials projects? 
So you're saying in the case of titanium dioxide, I think these annotates are rutile, right? That are very close to each other. Are you saying that you have to deform them to actually find the ground site? Yeah. Oh, it was the jury was still out whether it was rutile well, or annotate. Uh, I don't work with titanium dioxide, but it's oh, okay. a well-known transition metal oxide. Oh, um, fair enough. Uh, no, for, so for instance, if you introduce two excess holes, um, many theoretical predictions have shown that uh, in titanium dioxide, if you push two oxygen atoms together, uh, you form essentially a bipolar on, um, similar to the O2 to minus uh, ion. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing has been observed in uh, bismuth vanadate, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and other theoretical so you're, predictions. You're, so you're asking whether we can find certain properties of materials, whether they're whole formers or their defects by changing the lattice and, and, and changing certain aspects of how the lattice would relax under those conditions. Is that what you're asking? Not necessarily. Rather, um, how would you automate um, the formation of co more complex defects than just mm -hmm. a simple substitutional defect? Right. Yeah, no, I, I think I understand. So um, yeah, it's not always. Let's take let's take a more more uh, simple example like a Jan Teller distortion. You can't find a Jan Teller distortion unless you've just you've changed the symmetry and distorted your local environment so that you actually find because it's typically there's a little bit of a barrier to actually getting to that that distorted octahedra, for example, in manganese three. This is something that I would expect our experience. So if you're looking for those kinds of defects or you're looking for those kinds of local relaxations, you would have to, yes, automate the search for that by tweaking your local environment in different directions and seeing where there is maybe as an original barrier, but you end up in a lower energy state uh, as you keep going in that direction. And I do think that's totally doable. It can be automated, but it's probably going to be a little bit based on what you're looking for. So each workflow would have to be tailored somewhat to what defect or what local environment feature you're looking for. So I do think it's possible, but you would have to sort of use some of your intuition and then start training or testing your workflow on the cases you know and see you can find them. So there is still a job market for actual material science. <laughs> yeah, uh, no. Thank you, thank you, Nicholas. So let me let me read some other questions from the, the, the panel. So, so Xeya Mui is asking, uh, do you plan in the short or medium term to include the entropic contributions to the formation energy so that you can do convex hull with the free energy at a given temperature uh, rather than just the internal energy or enthalpy? Yes, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we are. Um, we have, through a beautiful partnership with our colleagues at uh, Louvain Lemeuve, we've, we've gotten 2,000 phonon dispersion curves on the Machos project, which has allowed us, at least for insulators, to get an estimate of the vibrational entropy. And 2,000 is probably good enough to do machine learning. So we're turning that into a machine learning sort of vehicle. We've also used other machine learning algorithms. Uh, Chris Bartel has a nice one that's based on experimental data that also can be added for any materials. And we typically use that in our case diagrams. That's just the beginning though. The configurational entropy part is, is, is more challenging. Um, but my husband has promised me for a couple of years now that he's going to have an automated cluster expansion algorithm for us available. And, you know, I'm as a community, I hope you will help me to hold him to that promise. And you should never believe you're a partner. <laughs> I can, I can add. Let, me go, let me go to Kirill Sidnov. Uh, is it planned to add uh, detailed examples to each uh, section in the PyMagen wiki? Uh, as it is done, for example, uh, for NumPy or the Scikit-Learn libraries. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed the beginning. So yeah, examples, sorry, so, basically. Uh, do you plan to add uh, uh, detailed examples to the different uh, sections of the PyMagen wiki? That is a great suggestion, and I'll take it to the to Matt Horton in my group and Shu Ping Ong, who are the two the, the two maintainers of PyMagen. I'm sure they'll be very happy to hear that. If that's a good idea. Cool. Thanks. And uh, we have Marco Fornari asking, uh, how do you envision uh, the interplay between uh, materials genomics uh, and the quantum information initiative? And... Yeah, uh, 
I had, have not worked much on QIS uh, research until I became the director of the Molecular Foundry. And, and it is indeed a large effort in the US in general and by the Department of Energy. I see, so I don't work in it myself, but I have, there are great theorists at the Molecular Foundry that, that work theoretically as well as um, um, experimentally on QIS systems. Um, what I've found is that yes, indeed, you can use genomic approaches to find out, for example, where do the defects sit? How do they talk to each other in the electronic structure? What is the thermal decoherence mechanisms that we see in the lattice? And those are all, I think, things we can unravel from a genomic perspective across crystal structures and chemistries. Cool, thanks. And if I can add a little advertisement on June 15, well, we'll have Dario Gilles from IBM Research talking exactly about accelerated material discovery, I think, at the intersection with, with quantum computing. Um, Christian, I think we have, uh, you know, held you for a very long time. Uh, but I still have a question myself uh, that, uh, that I want to ask. Uh, and uh, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, three dates. Uh, one is today, one is uh, tungsten, 1996 uh, and 2005. But let's take tungsten. So, you know, 25 years ago, maybe you could almost have imagined this. Uh, I think by 2005, you said, uh, you know, you could have imagined this. And so now the challenging question is for you to imagine, you know, in 25 years from now, what will be the future? So I hope we will do for experiments what we did with computations. I keep telling whoever wants to listen that automating and harnessing and curating the amount, the huge amount of experimental data that we produce today and that we could be producing in a much more robust way. And that will truly help us. If we correlate what we do computationally, we, for example, synthesis failures as well as successes, we have a way to truly become better than the sums of or the, the sums of the parts. Because today we, we we rely on experience and literature, and literature we tend to mostly find just successes. We don't catalog failures, and failures are incredibly important to understand what works and what doesn't to correlate thermodynamic and kinetic landscapes to synthesis routes, whether they work or not on the different chemical potentials and different external influences will allow us to be more predictive and faster in what we should be looking at, not just predicting the most beautiful computational material ever and with the atoms sit here and here and here, and I'd love to have that, but maybe I can never make it, but what can I make and in integrate that into our design vehicle? That's where I hope we'll be. Wonderful. Well, you have an open invitation uh, for a new Marvel Distinguished Lecture in 25 years. <laughs> we'll see. You, you uh, keep this, right? We're usually extremely bad at predicting the future. Oh, I, love, I love doing <laughs> it. There is, uh, there is no risk. Um, listen, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. It uh, was uh, really a wonderful lecture. Thanks again. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other and uh, you soon in person. I thank hope so too. You. Thank you from everyone. Thank and you so much, everybody. All the best and best of luck. Ciao, ciao, Christine. Bye.